Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. say you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some psyops going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema psyops. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. Cinema psyops. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. Hello! Welcome to the 280th episode of Cinema PsyOps. I'm sorry to say, folks, this is going to be not two, but one post. So you have half the co-hosts, but to make up for it, I am doing twice the amount of reviews, or at least I'm hoping that'll work. Now, when we covered the full franchise fest back way, way when at episode like, what, 275 or whatever we're at, because I think we're rounding the house on uh, 300 now, uh, I had said that I wasn't able to find what was supposed to be Sleepaway Camp for the Survivor, which I I've subsequently found out was never actually a completed film. So what I got my hands on here is actually a chopped together from the other films clip show. Uh, we'll get into that more later because I'm very unhappy about that. I was also able to locate the return to sleep away camp where not only Felissa Rose, but some of the other cast members from the original sleep away camp come back. And I'm actually kind of excited to talk about that one quite a bit. So I'm going to try and cover the movies the same way that we normally would. I did the notes on both of them actually earlier today because I found out Matt was definitely not going to be able to record for the movie Blythe, The Demon of Incest, and I'm probably not pronouncing that right because that's what we do here on Cinema PsyOps. But uh, Matt is not doing too well and is basically not able to record. Although we kept trying to give it the old college try, he continues to feel worse and worse. I'm going to have to get a little bit real here and just talk. Um, I spoke with Matt about this ahead of time and got permission to actually let you guys know what's going on. Um, Matt Matt and his family have contracted COVID. I will not tell the story as to how the illness made it to their home. That's not my place to tell that story. I'm going to leave that up to him and that's his decision. Um, The thing that's happening now, his wife seems to be uh, coming out the other side of it and his son seems to have pretty much no symptoms at all. So wife and son seem to be okay. Matt doesn't appear to be having any symptoms having to do with his lungs or breathing. He's able to breathe, it seems, uh, from what I'm told and from speaking, well, texting with him. And the big issue is it's like a stomach flu. Like he's got really bad issues where he's just vomiting a lot and can't really keep food down and stuff like that. I I won't get into too much detail or be too awful gross 
about it. So he's obviously very weak. I mean, he feels like crap already, but he's not able to really get food going. And it might be enough of concern where it could possibly be a situation eventually where if he can't get food in him, he will have to get an IV for some fluids and things like that, that he's missing electrolytes, that kind of stuff, just to help him fight this off. Uh, let's hope it doesn't come to that, but that's the, the next path for him as well. Uh, but it's not in his lungs, so let's look ahead to that. Uh, the rest of the family seems to be doing well. And Matt seems to be still in good spirits. It's just obviously, you know, that kind of ick really makes you feel awful as well. But let's just hope it's not going to be any more severe than what he's already experiencing. And I think he's in his second week where he's fighting it off. And these are like the biggest symptoms that have been hitting him in this second week. So hopefully he is rounding the corner to the positive side is that. Uh, we actually had a COVID hit our house here at PsyOps Studios as well. I'm going to tell you guys that now. Um, this happened back um, pretty close to, I would say, Bev started showing signs um, shortly after Halloween and shortly before Thanksgiving. Um, it was essentially pretty much two weeks before, give or take, where um, she may have contracted it. Uh, we did hand out candy during Halloween. Both of us wore masks. Both of us used hand sanitizer before we grabbed any of the candy. And I constructed a slide that slid the candy out to the kids. So, And we made sure we tried to keep everybody back. But we put on masks anytime we went anywhere near the candy. And just to make sure that everybody was safe, we kept them as far away as possible. Uh, Bev started having like head cold symptoms. But, you know, with some people, it's very mild. So the symptoms started feeling like or seeming like maybe it was allergies or just possibly dehydration, something along those lines. And then allergies and sinus issues. Because we both, her and myself, have sinus issues. I had had some sinus issues as well, but I myself never really developed any symptoms at all. Uh, I never lost my sense of taste or smell. Um, Bev did on the Sunday after she started showing symptoms, lost her sense of smell and her sense of taste that they had gone by that Sunday uh, after she started showing symptoms on a Tuesday. And that's when she went and got tested. It was confirmed a few days later. Uh, we were actually recording an episode of Cinema PsyOps the night after Bev had gotten tested and we had to wait like three days for the results or maybe it was the night she got tested and we had to wait for two days. I can't really remember now. Uh, but there was a conversation that Matt and I was having about this very realistically where I was telling him there's no way I'm not going to catch it. And he had made the joke about, and I don't want to brag or anything, but I open mouth kiss my wife, which was a gold joke about that situation that, you know, you're going to catch whatever it is that they they have. And I, I wanted to keep the joke. So I put the joke in there, even though it was a non sequitur, um, because it was a moment of jovial, <laughs> you know, uplifting thing that we had just before when I'm panic stricken and wondering what's going to happen to me. Um, I want to tell you guys, I decided not to talk about my experience because I never developed any symptoms really at all. I had like kind of a stuffy nose, but my sinuses were also dry. So I don't really know if I ever really had any symptoms at all. Nothing that would have been enough for me to be able to tell. And as was suggested by my wife after her checkup, whenever her symptoms were all gone and the quarantine period ended, she went and got a full checkup. It seems like she came through it just fine. Um, the doctors gave her a clean bill of health and basically let her know that it didn't seem like anything was more damaged. And she had actually luckily had a checkup just a few months before the pandemic hit that they could compare it against to see if anything was done, you know, blood work and all of that. And her doctor suggested for me to come in and get a blood test because when I got tested, I came up negative as well. That's the other thing. I don't know how that works, but I didn't catch it from her, even though we live in the same house, we sleep in the same bed and not to brag or anything, but I do open mouth kiss my wife. So there you go. Um, God, this is not easy stuff to talk about, but um, Bev's symptoms were mild and she seemed to come out the other side of it as well. Um, it seems that uh, Matt's family, for the most part, the two of them that he shares the household with are doing well and their symptoms are not there or mild, even though they both tested positive. I tested negative. I still have no idea how that happened. Uh, we're going to get me to a doctor. Uh, that's not a huge priority right this minute with everything happening with the pandemic and everything being pretty busy. I'm going to hold off and and get the test for the antigens to COVID shortly. Um, but let us hope that though Matt is experiencing 
stomach issues and is quite vomitously ill that he will come out the other side of this and be absolutely fine so everybody keep him in your thoughts and uh, we hope to have him back on the show as early as next week but as of right now I am recording this on a Wednesday night those of you that pay attention that is two days after I am even comfortable recording an episode to get it out by Sunday that's not true we go Tuesday night sometimes but it's one day past what I'm really comfortable doing I had to do the notes tonight right before I'm recording on both movies I'm recording right now and I'm going to turn around and edit everything and all the clips that I grabbed and edit it all together and try and still get it out by Sunday even with Christmas looming and the various obligations you have that have to do with that but I love you guys You've always been here for me I'm going to be there for you and we're all going to be there for Matt now enough of this sad weepy talk um, let's all hope for the best for him and uh, let's take some time to talk about some fucking movies now what we're going to do right now we're going to take a little break we're going to play the Legion GoFundMe promo we're going to have a little bit of music that I yanked probably out of Sleepaway Camp 4 if it's there and when we come back we will have no trailer because one does not exist this is Bo from LegionPodcasts.com Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand-scale take-a-penny-leave-a-penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar. For those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on, well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon. Oh my God, it's you, Angela! Okay, I mentioned it earlier, Sleepaway Camp 4 was a production that was going to take place, which was called The Survivor, and the idea was going to be um, an amnesiac Angela, which may or may not have become susceptible to the injuries and the brain trauma, as well as the other trauma that happened that we see at the end of Sleepaway Camp 3. I guess they shot a few things, but they didn't actually shoot footage footage. There was like rehearsal things that were shot on VHS that they did with an actress um, and like a handful of other actors like maybe two other actors they did the stuff like I think they were working on their blocking or whatever I don't know it showed up apparently on the DVD box set that Anchor Bay did the Sleepaway Camp box set where it was a fourth disc that just had the raw footage now from what I understand someone apparently got that cut it together with the clip show that we're about to discuss you know from the other DVDs or from VHS's or whatever it just depends some of the footage it's a little different I think they just used what they had when they found it and uh, that's kind of the let's call it a movie that we're going to be talking about because it's more or less like a fan film compilation thing. I don't know. Well, here we fucking go. The film starts with the ending of part three where Angela is beat down by the redhead heroine. As some of our listeners may recall, I mentioned she was the leader in the fast food movie with Jim Varney and Tracy Lords. Uh, she was like the head of the gas station. They turned into a fast food joint that served burgers that made everybody horny. Well, anyway, she was our redheaded heroine in the the third Sleepaway Camp film. And then we see the footage of Angela in the ambulance that kind of cut to it real quick. And then we see Angela killing her way out of the ambulance to get away. She runs away. And then they cut from that to footage of all of the dead folks from part two, that uh, cabin setup that they had at the very end of part two. They kind of show that where they're panning around. And they sort of do this like weird 
freeze frame thing over one of the corpses and then they have this blurb pop up where it says Dr. Lewis dash patient file Allison Kramer last record Thursday October 14th 1993 it says Allison is a woman without an identity she is plagued by horrific nightmares fragments of twisted memories blocked by selective amnesia after numerous visits and hypnosis sessions I was able to research the source of her night terrors I advised her that she is very likely a survivor of a series of sleepaway camp massacres which occurred over the past decade. The killer, named Angela, was never found. With her psyche no closer to being unlocked, I strongly suggest she return to the campsite for an afternoon. It's now federal land and I've arranged for the forest ranger Jack to meet her there. My hope is that she's able to see the scene of the crimes she will remember them and overcome them and in so doing discover who she really is but who is Allison really so those are supposed to be like the doctor's notes and I just took screen caps of that because there's no fucking way I'm typing that all down I'll tell you that much there's then a double cut scene after that of Angela from one of the other movies Uh, it's the Pamela Springsteen playing Angela and she has her ponytail pulled up not the wig from part three so I'm assuming it's going to be in part two uh, but kind of hard to tell And then they cut to the footage with the new actress that we were talking about that we're kind of seeing in the film here, who's supposed to be the character of Allison. She looks up screaming when they cut to the other older, grainier footage of the Pamela Springsteen playing Angela looking down and she screams, oh God, it's you, Angela. The title pops and we see Sleepaway Camp for the survivor. And after a handful of like single line credits where like they do the name of a person and it's one name of a person on the screen and they just switch, you know, it's like nature shots the name of a person on the screen and they just switch it out for another nature shot and another person's name on this on the screen and it's kind of a way just to pat out the running time it's about an hour and 10 minutes and you feel like every second of this we then see a lady sunbathing on a lakeside dock this is our i'm assuming character allison and that leads to our first clip i remember a day like today when angela stalked these ground looking for her revenge a tent on top of that hill was a scene of a gruesome attack. This then leads to a cutscene from Sleepaway Camp 3 of Herman from Scrooge getting nasty with the Playboy Bunny tattooed teen and then murdered. I think you folks kind of remember that when we covered it. All right, so then after this death, we cut to our next clip. That Angela, she was such a freak. No one knew why she was so crazy. Or did some of us know why? This intros the bit from part one where the reveal Angela was the injured son Peter from the boating accident forced to live as Angela. We even see that completely recreated up to the point where the aunt or Peter slash Angela says the boy won't do it all, a boy won't do it all or whatever. And then we cut back to the Allison character sunbathing and she is noted in my notes as sunbathing beauty because whatever. That leads to her speaking in our next clip. I remember that day. We then cut to the footage from part one of the kids arriving at the camp and Angela being bullied and then all of that stuff that happened in part one they just kind of jump around but they're cutting back and forth showing how Angela was bullied and picked on then they cut to the cop in part three talking about what happened to Angela and how she had done the murders and everything they're reusing the footage from two or three whichever one it is but it's of the nightmare sequence of Angela talking before singing happy camper and it's cut together with shots of her actually being abused and picked on in part one so it's like footage from part two but they're re-showing footage from part one and just kind of laying out the story using a clip show. We're only like 12 minutes into this at this point and I fucking hate it. Anyway, next we see Angela's cousin from the first movie, Ricky, looking for her when the child rapist cook has her all to himself. It's just him like asking somebody where she is and then the counselor saying they don't care or whatever and then one of the other people saying who cares. But it cuts off right before Ricky shows up for the confrontation and then it cuts from that to part three where Angela kills the bookworm lady that's lazy and just sits there and wants to read all day and makes the kids even cook her steak even though she won't let him eat them. Um, it's that scamming lady that was scamming 
slamming all the campers. Well, anyway, it's the footage of her buried up to her neck in the garbage before Angela runs her over with the lawnmower. This is intercut with the cook going after Angela in the first movie. We see it now because I guess proper story structure can just go fuck itself the way they're doing it. It's a fucking clip show. They're doing what they're going to do. They cut from this to part three where they find the dead bookworm lady. And this has a cut with a severed head when Angela says the line about every time she goes to camp, someone loses their head. I believe the severed head was the main character's boyfriend, Renee Estevez's boyfriend in the second film. If the if my severed head memory works, I guess. Anyway, Angela talks about Molly in the shot. So they cut to Molly being cleaned up in part two where Angela's talking to her and asking her if she's hungry. And all I can think the whole time watching this is how fucking pointless this is. I could just watch those other two movies again. But then they show the next confrontation with the cop and Angela from part three where he's got the board and everything and then she ends up shooting him. We then cut back to Allison, who is our sunbathing beauty, and our fourth clip. Were they crazy? She's back at camp as a counselor. Then it cuts to Angela talking to Molly in part two about drowning the boy in part one, which we now see that on screen because it's a fucking clip show. Next is the part two campfire chat with the story of the fried rat in the fried chicken place. The boy that was super annoying and kept interrupting everybody was saying that, trying to scare everybody, really being immature. This is when the only girl at the campfire starts telling the tale of Angela and they use that once again, but they're going to clip in various things while she's telling the story because it's again another clip show. This time while she's telling the story of the kids being hacked to death though, we do get it to cut back to part one where we see the aftermath of the kids' deaths in the camp out. Then when the girl's talking about Meg being stabbed in the shower, they cut to showing us that part in part one where Meg, the shitty fucking counselor, has to run off to take a shower by herself and then is murdered by Angela with the stab through the shower. Then that girl at the campfire is telling the story of the cook being boiled in water. We cut to part one where Angela dumps the cook in the large pot of boiling water for the corn. Then the girl's telling the story of the owner of the camp getting shot in the neck with an arrow. And we cut to part one where we see that. Now, I think what they're attempting to do here, and I don't really want to speak for them because, again, I think this is just sort of like a fan film. But what this reminds me of is the story of Jason sort of thus far where they retcon it in part two and tell the story by the campfire. But then they kind of reuse that in part four, but they're doing like a here's what you've missed so far. And they kind of build up to it before they go into the next movie. And it's not very long, but they cut in some of the previous kills because this is supposed to be the final Friday. Like that is what they're doing. And I really like it when they do that in part four and it works for me really, really well. But the thing is, it's just a quick like catch them up saga sale segment. When you do it for an entire movie or for fuck's sakes, even a half hour of a TV show, it's awful. Clip shows are the fucking worst. She then reveals a story of how Angela was actually a boy who was forced to be a shy 14 year old girl, which we didn't see that. Although Angela does interrupt the story. This is all from the part two once again, that whole campfire thing we're talking about. Once Angela interrupts, we get backstory about how Angela was actually Peter and forced to live as Angela. But this time they talk about how Angela has gone over to be fully a trans woman after surgery and all the counseling with Angela standing right there. We've seen this in part two. It's all that. Because she's talking about Angela standing naked on the shore and the big reveal that Angela was a boy forced to live as a girl in part one, we then cut to that scene from part one because of course we fucking do. It's a clip show. We then see Angela killing the girl who told the campfire story. They just cut right to that and cutting off her tongue. And then it cuts to Angela talking about how she had to send her home. The only saving grace of this entire clip show thus far at the 25 minutes is that you get to see a highlight of all of the boob shots with some of these kills so far. Like some of the sequences, there's boobs as the kills are right before they happen or, you know, as they're happening or whatever, but otherwise just fuck this shit. Then it cuts to a scene of the two stoner girls from part two getting high and Angela watching. This somehow cross dissolves into our sunbathing beauty, Allison. She's sort of dipping down into the lake like she's walking down the ladder slowly testing the water and I think she's up to about like her half but she's more or less like dipping her toes in the water to check the temperature and she's right there on the dock and that leads to our next clip the first week back at the lake poor angela she was afraid of the water just like a cat or was it bad memories Uh uh-oh Here comes the Wicked Witch of the West. This then cuts into a scene where Angela is dragged and dropped into the lake by Meg, fucking Meg, and fucking clip shows. Then the next cut is for TC hitting on Angela in part two. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that's where he tries to get her to come swim, and he says something about how she needs to work on her tan. Then we cut to part one again, where the boys are balloon fighting up on the roof, if you guys remember that. Uh, They're like on one of the cabins of the roof, and they all attack Angela with
with the water balloons. This then cuts to Angela being soaked by the pervy kids who snap photos of the girls undressing in part two. I don't know if you guys remember that or not. They put the bucket above there and it drops over her. So they're doing like a water gag now. All the water gags Angela was perpetrated with. Then it cuts to those two kids dead and tied to face inward, looking in a window of a girl's cabin. They even show the counselor who found them as she runs off to try and get help into the owner's office where there are more dead bodies, one of them being the owner that Angela has posed. The counselor begins screaming before she is murdered by Angela as well. This then cuts to where Judy and Megan throw Angela into the lake again. Oh, and the kids torture her and then Angela's cousin gets accosted by the owner because he thinks that Ricky is the one that did all of the killing, if you remember. This is all from part one. Once again, they cut in the actress that we were seeing sunbathing, playing Allison. She's now looking around as well, and we still kind of hear Angela's cousin trying to comfort Angela after nearly being drowned. I don't know what this is all supposed to represent, but here we are where the girl's kind of sitting there. Allison's staring off, and they show that. Uh, We then see that what Allison is looking at is the ranger that they supposedly had uh, bring her to the camp, because now it's federal land. And the ranger's looking around as well, and it sort of cuts back and forth between these two images. Given what we know about how this is just temporary production footage that was shot with a VHS camera, I suppose, these images being cut the way that they are, you know, they're using what they can here, but it kind of makes sense where I guess, like, you know, she's trying to figure out who she is. She's looking around, and then it just cuts to the kids getting all freddied up, if you remember that from part two, where they're going to try and scare Angela. So the kid's all freddied up, and we actually hear him say something about how he's going to give Angela a nightmare when they get ready to go scare her in part two. We then cut to see Angela's nightmare. I don't know if it's like the footage that is this clip show or if it's the nightmare that happened in part two that they then clipped in other footage but it's got like this weird filter on it so it doesn't look quite right like they they tried to change it a little bit to make it look a little different but just doesn't really work I don't like I said I don't know if it's an integrated footage or clip show or whatever it's supposed to be we then see the kid in the Freddy mask um, crawling around trying to find his glove and then Angela kills him and then we see the Jason right before Angela kills them both then it cuts to Angela fishing in part three with the two guys from the inner city youth program where the government check was being sent out like she's in that group and she pulls up the hockey mask when they showed the kid from the hockey mask so that's what they cut to but they kind of waited too long I think in between the cuts I don't know but uh, whatever they then show the one kid blowing up the fish right next to Angela so she's running off and screaming in part three then they cut to Allison she's now standing around in a sweatshirt and like I think jeans or some type of like leggings I couldn't really tell and that's our next clip all that publicity about those murders and deaths. It was so terrible. Then it cuts to the death of the drowned kid from part one, where the snake is actually crawling out of his mouth and everything. Uh, Then we see the ambulance guys are trying to take the body away, and that's when Mel is screaming about how he drowned and everything's fine. Uh, I guess, whatever, it's from part one, and it's where he tries to cover it all up right before he has to admit it's like the second death after the cook has the accident, but he's not fully dead. Then he tries to talk the cops out of closing the camp or making a big deal out of it. He's trying to basically save the camp and make more money. They then cut from that to Angela in part three, where the group is all getting together with the reporter, uh, complete with the interview a little bit with Angela there. And it cuts to Angela in part two, talking to the owner of the camp Rolling Hills. I think that's what it was. I think it was Rolling Hills in that camp. Then we cut to Allison staring off at the lake, again, still wearing the sweat shirt and pants combo here. And that's our next clip. Whatever happened to the good kids in the world? Oh, (laughs) don't talk like that uncle john there's lots of good kids we just have to weed out the bad that is what she did after this clip we see it's like the only kill set up in the films where angela kills two kids they're actually pretty good kids the one was just checking up on the other because she was concerned and then the other one just happened to be a tattletale in the wrong place at the wrong time so saying that she only punishes guilty kids and then cutting to this doesn't make sense if you know the story. They cut from this to a shot of the boyfriend of Renee Estevez's character still alive and tied up in the cabin, confronting Angela about her murders and everything, talking about how his dad is a cop. We've we've seen this. Then we can see 
a cut of the only person that is the new character to this series saying off to camp again. So Allison just says off to camp again. That's all we get. And then we have a cut of a girl getting ready at the beginning of part three. That's where she's topless and she's getting ready. And I guess it's one of the inner city at risk youth. Then we see her get run over by the truck once again. And Angela shows up to replace her back to the reporter in the whole registration thing. And that's where Angela ends up saying that she's going to give the reporter cocaine, but it turns out it's just drain cleaner of some sort that killed her. They kind of jump back and forth and re-edit this and it's really choppy and kind of hard to see. More jump cuts and clips of the murder of the girl in part three that Angela tries to replace. We then see the singing of the Happy Camper song in part two. And then the trust exercise with the racist girl where Angela has her tied up and is leading her off that happens in part three. And we also see where she hangs around the flagpole and then drops her to kill her. And then a cut of Angela lighting the dynamite or maybe a M80 or something along those lines, but like the explosive that the kid had in part three where she put it into his mouth and lit it and it blows up the kid's fucking face um, that scared her with that same explosive. Then we see the death of the rat blaring teen from earlier and then it sort of crisscross dissolves with some stuff with Angela in part one where they talk about the rules of the camp or something along those lines. And then we overdub the voice of those only two new characters that we were seeing in the movie. The We sort of saw the ranger, but he doesn't really do much other than just kind of look. But now he comes up and he's the newest character <laughs> to actually show up. And then our Allison character that's in this movie, if you can call it that, talking about how Angela remembers. All right, we see some more confrontations from the other films where they're jumping back and forth, running around with all of the deaths, including my favorite death in part two, where the shitty girl gets drowned in the old outhouse. I really fucking love that. It's hilarious. Uh, they managed to squeeze in the curling iron death. Some of the fire deaths, like specifically the stoner girls where they're tied over the barbecue pit and the one wakes up and her sister's already burned to death and she comes to and has to look at her sister's burned corpse or the lady's friend's burned corpse. I can't remember which one is. Um, then there's a little bit where there's a girl that just wants to go home that's in part two and Angela ends up drilling her to death and then they show another girl trying to go home in part two which Angela tries to talk her out of but then she decides she just wants to go on her own. We then return to Allison in our next clip. I have to get out of here before I go crazy like Angela. Where's that ranger? This transitions into a sort of would-be sex scene with our Allison character and the guy that we guess is the ranger. Um, it, at least it appears to be a sex scene. They're sort of slowly unbuttoning each other's shirts, staring at each other's eyes lovingly for a second. They kiss a little bit. They kind of say hi to each other and smile. They're in some kind of a cabin. I don't, like I said, it's just a cut, but I think, again, it's like test footage that just got used to being her cut with this. So He asked her to smile or something like that. I can't remember what it is. And then he says something about answering a few questions. She decides she can't have sex with him for some reason. We then see a cut of Angela making out on the beach with her would-be beau in part one and her shoving him off of her and not being comfortable. We then cut back to see uh, the ranger and Allison making out again. Uh, her shirt opens up just a little bit and the ranger starts fondling her breast with, like, you know, with a bra still on. He's just grabbing a hold of the bra breast and all. The girl tells the ranger she cannot do this and ends up running off once again screaming, now pulling her shirt almost completely off as she exits the cabin, I believe. The ranger screams something like bitch and goes after her in pursuit after he rips open the door to the cabin. So we now have a chase scene between our character Allison and the ranger, but it cuts back and forth with Angela running in like black and white through the forest as well. I'm not sure what this is supposed to represent other than we're supposed to get it. Yeah, Allison is Angela. Angela is Allison. It was kind of obvious from the start, but what we're seeing here doesn't really convey that. It just jumps back and forth and it's kind of irritating. The ranger then catches up with our character that apparently now has no name, even though she's supposed to be Allison. And he gets super fucking rapey on her and uh, starts ripping at her clothes and fondling her a little bit. This kind of cross cuts to Angela fighting off or moving away from her specific bow in the first movie as we see Allison that's fighting off the ranger and then runs away. We then see more black and white footage of Angela looking around the woods and covered in dirt and running around. And and that's part two or part three. I th it's pretty sure it's part two because it's Angela with the with the ponytail, not the wig. So a lot of it is Angela running through the woods. Probably the footage of her just chasing Renee Estevez's character, but just repurposed to look like she's running away. And more of this is happening. There's a lot of running around when they finally show us come across a hunter of some sort. Uh, he's got on the hunting vest and is carrying a gun. And he's got like this little fucking Elmer Fudd hat too. Anyway, that's our next clip. Oh, you scared the daylights out of me. What are you, crazy? <laughs> You want to get shot or something? Stupid. 
was ready from the ranger. Ranger? What ranger? There's no ranger around here. He's chasing me. All right, calm down. Oh, God. Just get the hell out of me. <laughs> what are you doing here? The ranger was chasing me. My dad is... After this, we see point of view footage of someone running through the forest talking about where they run, where they hide, where is he? I'm assuming they're talking about the ranger. You know, where where is the where is this person going to run? Where can they hide? Whatever. This is then cut back and forth with someone dragging a body. I think it's Angela part two. It's kind of hard to tell. But it's just a body being dragged. And I'm pretty sure it's from part two, but I can't be 100 percent certain. We also have a cutting of other murders and various things like that. And it's starting to here as though the film wants us to believe that the person roaming the woods who is supposed to be our hero is in fact Angela. I say this sarcastically because it's been obvious the entire time. And she's apparently having some kind of a psychotic break or even perhaps a full breakthrough of realizing who she is. We then see what's supposed to be our heroine confront the ranger with a 9mm or at least a carved gun that's made out of wood that I think they use as a prop. Again, test footage, not judging them for that, just that's what you're seeing. And she is pointing it at his throat, saying that she doesn't like him and to stay away or to stay out or something like that. I don't fucking know. Then it cuts to the tent we saw from earlier when she was talking about the supposed murder that happened with Herman from Scrooged and where he got murdered. They cut to that inside of the tent, but it turns out it's supposed to be the hunter's tent then that uh, confronted our heroine earlier in the clip that we heard in this movie. We then see the hunter cleaning his shotgun. The heroine of our story here, Allison, again, (laughs) I sarcastically right who I'm now really suspecting might be Angela confronts the hunter and that's our final clip now look who's being hunted okay why are you doing this you're gonna help me all right help you how After that gunshot at the end, we have a cut to our Allison slash Angela standing, holding a knife, which reveals that she is completely 100% Angela in a very awkward way. She basically has the tip of the blade just above her chest, but the bottom of her hand is right about at her jawline. And she's wearing like this black bikini top and like a pair of different colored bottoms. I think in that shot, it looked like she was wearing khakis because they were just trying to shoot her from the waist up for this test footage. But that doesn't matter because they cut from that to some back and forth with a shot of Angela on the beach and part one after she makes the kill where Angela is just standing there with her mouth open ready to scream and then we see the part where Angela is in the ambulance at the end of part three driving home the point that this is supposed to be Angela we go back and forth between these things a couple of times and it's apparently Angela she's in a pair of bikini briefs now and just a black bikini top she confronts the ranger who I'm assuming Assuming she kills, it dissolves into a night shot of a cabin with the dead ranger. So he, she, she definitely killed him. And the ranger is sitting next to another corpse that may be the hunter, looked kind of skinned. We fade to a contrast shot that's just like a darker contrast of that exact same shot. And fuck, thank you. Finally, we roll credits. All right, I know I was really hard on this, but this is clearly not a movie. If you go through any of the IMDb reviews of it, other people have said the exact same thing. At best, this is a clip show that was made by a fan who just was trying to get the story conveyed across as it may have been in the original script or whatever the original idea for the story was. For what that is, whoever did this, it is at least competently put together as far as that goes, where they just made a pretty effective editing clip show. Uh, But entertainment value is next to nothing on this unless you were dying to absolutely watch it. I would basically say don't even bother looking for it. It's really not worth your time unless you're absolutely dying to see it. I think I found it on YouTube. I think that may have been where I found it. I can't exactly remember because I just grabbed it and I had it for the review and now I never want to see it again. Uh, I don't really have too many other thoughts on this other than that. um, Again, I don't think it's worth your fucking time. I kind of wish I had the hour and 10 minutes of the movie I had to watch and then the amount of time it took me to do all this production back. Anyway, fuck that movie. Let's move on to the return to Sleepaway Camp. That's a much more exciting film that I can't wait to talk about. After we take this little break, we're going to play the Geek Radio Daily promo. And we'll have a little bit of more music that I snagged out of either Return to Sleepaway Camp or maybe Sleepaway Camp 4. We'll see how I'm feeling Randy with it. And when we come back, we will
will cover Sleepaway Camp 4. Are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery? Is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world? To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. So, like I said, I found some kind of music to fit in here. Hopefully, I used something from the movie. <laughs> All right, let's stop fucking around. Let's talk about this movie. We've got to do this review. All right, so this is Return to Sleepaway Camp. The film opens with a credit sequence that is intercut with an ad for the original Camp Arawak, which is the site of the first killings. And then we see some of the actors' names showing up, and you have to kind of really look for them because it's like newspapers where it's cross-dissolving between newspaper articles to kind of bring you in. It's like a saga sale thing. Kind of neat the way they do it where you see some... Uh, various stories about the various killings that have happened with the names showing up in the articles for the various actors and things like that. And they make it obvious whenever they bring the name of the actor in, but you can kind of see it if you pay attention ahead of time where they bring it up and everything. It's pretty well done little sequence here. Uh, things like that. With the only thing being that I have a problem with, there's some kind of very fucking early 2000s rap metal combo new metal. That's spelled N-U new metal. This dissolves into some teenage boys lighting their farts afire. When I say teenage, I mean they might be just 13 because they all look pretty immature as teenage boys that age are want to do yeah they light their gas from their ass we were dumb at that age then we see one giant bully shows up thinks that they are making fun of him and immediately goes into being violent towards them and angry. He wants to have his own chance at lighting a fart on fire when he thinks it's actually pretty hilarious. He then sort of bullies more of the kids. He says one of the kids pees their bed all the time or something like that, uh, like pretty much every night, right before he hops on some other kid's bed to light his fart on fire. And it sounded pretty wet and juicy, which makes it not that impressive of a fire, which it's a significantly smaller flame. And then the other kids apparently, you know, start making fun of him according to him. So he grabs an aerosol can in his rage that he can't control, lights it on fire and starts spraying it at them to try and scare them. This is clearly a kid with a lot of anxiety who can't fit in and feels he can't make friends. So he lashes out with violence and anger. I don't have a problem with a kid that needs special attention for emotional distress, but I don't feel that a camp with other children who are fucking demons are the place for this child. And I feel immediately bad for him, even though he's being a abusive and irritating. This is the stance I'm going to take. This kid probably should not be at this camp because he needs a camp that will nurture him as an individual. And this camp is all about the money and any kids who don't fit in are getting picked on. It's really difficult, however, because he is such an asshole to people who don't deserve it because everybody's a fucking asshole to him. So he lashes back out of people. So there's going to be moments where it seems like I'm defending him and I sympathize with him. That's because in those moments I kind of do. And then there's other moments where he's being a complete and total fucking dick and I don't like him either. So 
that's where we're at. So right there as he's spraying the fire at the kids, their camp counselor comes in to confront him, grabs him right by the hair and puts him almost in a chokehold and tells him he's being fucking stupid. The kid is being an asshole, but immediately somehow throws this camp counselor out of the way. Like I said, the kid's like almost twice the size of their camp counselor. He's really tall and he's built. He's just this big kid. He grew fast early. Then after he throws the camp counselor against the wall, he says the guy's ass stinks, which becomes a motif and then runs off. The counselor tells him to get back here as a counselor is wont to do, but the kid still goes running out the door. The counselor then begins to talk to the other kids about how he's going to give this kid, Alan, a lesson someday that he will never forget. The kids say, whatever, Alan always gets away with everything. And then the counselor responds with, trust me, boys, it will happen or something along those lines. And then he heads out the door. The next day they are at lunch. The big kid is being a bully and a dick. Once again, he throws something at one of the other kids. Again, I think it just, he wants attention because no one really wants to be around him and no one accepts him. So he's lashing out. The camp counselor says that his brother is moving in on his girlfriend to this kid who's currently bullying his cabin mates. He calls him a wanker because the guy's apparently Australian. And he then grabs this ketchup bottle in one hand and then shakes it as if he's simulating masturbation when he calls the guy a wanker. He calls the kid a wanker and then says that, you know, the guy's stealing his brother, stealing his uh, girlfriend because of that, which the girl is clearly not his girlfriend. He just has a crush on her and they're just again taunting him, the poor fucking kid. We then have Big Pussy himself from The Sopranos, Vincent Pastore. And apparently he has lost a good deal of weight since the days of The Sopranos because he's looking pretty fucking healthy and fit in this movie. He delivers a speech and that's our first clip. Listen up. Quiet down. Excuse me. (laughs) Excuse me. Let me handle this, Frank. Hey! Shut it! Thank you, doll. Today we are very fortunate to have with us one of our local policemen to talk to us firsthand about the dangers of smoking. (laughs) (laughs) Guess what? Now that's enough. Try not to act like animals for a minute. You think you guys can do that? (laughs) Mr. Spassky, how'd you like to clean those tables all by yourself today? No, sir. Then shut up! You're such a fucking spaz. (laughs) You kids have no respect for anything. It's all right, Frank. I'll take it from here. Don't worry, kids. I'll be brief so you can get back to this delicious food. Hey, why are you talking like that? (laughs) I'm glad you asked. After 35 years of smoking, I lost my larynx to cancer. Hey, dude, can you play Intergalactic on that thing? (laughs) Maybe later. Luke, you must use the force. <laughs> Spinelli, give me that thing right now. Hot potato. Trace. What thing? <laughs> it's no big deal. You know what? Forget it. These kids appreciate nothing. <laughs> <laughs> stuff sucks. I want something else to eat. Too bad. Can't eat this junk. I'll throw up. Then you'll throw up. Now eat the chicken before I shove it down your throat. No, you eat it. Eat the fucking chicken, Alan. Leave me alone. Eat it. No. Right, that's it. Clean it up. No, you. I said clean it up. Let go of me. Clean it up now. Let me go. I'll see you two at it again. He's throwing food at the other kids. And then he threw his plates on the floor. He's hitting me for no reason. Stop lying, Alan. You're the liar. All right, calm down. Alan, why don't you just come with me? Right? You're such a pussy, Alan. Hey, Randy, your ass stinks. <laughs> Alan, I think we agreed you were going to work extra hard to behave yourself. I'm trying, Ronnie, but everybody keeps picking on me because I'm different. No one thinks you're different, Alan. Why don't you just start trying to be a little more cooperative, okay? okay. Hey, do you think I can go to the kitchen and get something else to eat? Sure you can, but just remember what we talked about, okay? Okay, I promise. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Quit it, Alan, you... <laughs> Good job, Bella. Did you see that? Leave it alone, Petey. What'd you do that for? Because your face looked like my ass. The problem? <laughs> I hate you, Bella. Oh, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> you eat this, you shit. Oh, you puss bag. Down, girl, down, girl. Easy, easy. Ronnie's right there. Chill. Chill. Move it. Sorry. Thick. Well, look who's here. Chill problem, child. Hey, Charlie. Can I get something else to eat? I'm on my way out, little man. Mickey will take care of it. Great. Hey, Mickey, 
Didn't I tell you to put the goddamn trash bags in the dumpster? I'm infested with rats in here. All right, don't blow an artery, okay? Just make sure you do it this time. I said I fucking do it, all right? Jesus Christ. Should have found his ass a long time ago. Well, you keep mumbling, old man. What do you want? I guess I'll have some ice cream. Hey, I cream my ass. I'll decide what you're gonna have. You ready? Egg salad and tuna salad. That stuff sucks. I want ice cream. Well, that's tough shit, ain't it? Now hurry up. I'm busy. As you heard in the background there, we have more stars in this than just Vincent Pastore, or at least names that you would recognize. We also have the Duke of New York himself, Isaac Hayes, is the chef. Yeah, I get it. He's the chef in South Park, so now he's the chef in this film. I don't care. (laughs) I let it go. You can also see that we have a level of acting in situations that are a little more of the like amped up slasher cliches. I think they're doing that on purpose and going over the top because it's somewhat camp. I don't feel that it was a choice that was made other than they just wanted the actors to have fun because it looks like everybody's having fun on screen for the most part except for the kid who plays Alan every time he's on screen he's causing me pain and torturing me in some way shape or form and making me uncomfortable which is exactly what his character is supposed to be there for that kid is really good at what he does and it's definitely one hell of a fucking upgrade from part four like find this one first before you try and find part four all right so after the clip the kid goes to grab the ice cream anyway even though he was told and threatened by the what some folks may know is his name is Lenny Vito. Uh, You may know him from various movies and stuff like that. He's one of those that guy actors that pops up. You will know him when you see him and stuff. But the kid steals the ice cream even though he was told not to and he just starts eating it. We cut back to the other campers with a girl asking for orange juice. Just I guess it's a jump cut just to kind of cover a mistake or something. And then we see that Alan is there chowing down on the ice cream. He gets caught stealing it and eating it all at once. He gets made fun of by Lenny who tells him to get out of here and then he starts throwing eggs at him. No, seriously a grown man is throwing eggs at a little child. I mean, big child. A possibly mentally handicapped child. The kid then tells Lenny that he sucks, and then Lenny tells him to get the fuck out of the kitchen. I'm saying the actor's name because I didn't catch the character's name, and I don't really fucking care. The kid throws a pot at him, which crashes and makes a huge, loud noise. This drags the cop and Vincent Pastore's character of Frank into the kitchen, and Lenny lobs more eggs at the fucking kid. The kid then really gets angry and lobs a knife at Lenny sticking it in the wall very close to his head. This sets off a shitstorm, which ends in the kid actually calling Vincent Pastore a big pussy, which if you know the Sopranos is, I guess it's kind of funny. Again, I just ignored it. Just brought it up for you guys. Uh, Alan then freaks out even more, telling everyone he hopes that they die and runs off. This is all in front of the cop with the suspicious fake beard. Oh, fuck, it's Angela. All right. It's clearly Felissa Rose with a fake nose and a fake beard and mirrored sunglasses. They did the best that they could, but it's clearly Felissa Rose's Angela. Just let it go and have fun with it because the characters are apparently too fucking stupid to realize it, even though we know all along it's Angela. So I guess what they're doing now is Angela is dressed as a man to be this sheriff hiding out using the voice box for a person that's supposed to have their larynx removed. That's how they're doing it. And that's to cover up the fact that it's Felissa Rose, who in this story, if we're following along with part two and part three, I'm assuming is a fully transitioned woman who's hiding out dressed as a man in this. I don't, I don't know, but that's, it's the character of Angela played by the original actress, Felissa Rose. Whether it's Peter or not, it's hard to tell. They kind of jump back and forth with this, which is really confusing in certain ways and seems pretty insensitive to our transitioned brothers and sisters out there. So I don't know exactly how to take this other than whatever Angela says, I'm assuming Angela says it in the future to cover up the fact that Angela is the cop hiding out. That's how I'm looking at it. I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's just how I chose to view it because I didn't want to look at it as any other negative connotation. All right, somehow Ronnie is back in this film as well. We saw him earlier in the film, but I didn't realize it until now. And this dude is in better shape now in this film and looking much better as the older man that he is than I ever will in my entire life. Pure and simple. We then see Vincent Pastore's character yells at the stepbrother, I guess his name is Michael, of Alan demanding him to bring his stepbrother back to Ronnie. Uh, He's going to bring him to Ronnie's shack and the kid's like, he's not my brother. He says, shut up and just do it. He gets very big pussy on him and talks like real mean and, you know, uses that that, like real baritone yell at him. And then this dissolves into a shot of a log leaning against a waterfall and our next clip. Hey, dickhead, throw down! You know, I'm really 
really getting tired of taking care of your ass. I'm not going back, Michael! Ever! Everyone's always picking on me! Stop crying, you big baby. Everyone's always picking on me. Nobody likes me. Quiet! Still dicking around with the frogs. They're my friends! Yeah, right. Whoa! Look at this mother! What are you doing? What? You heard him! These are men, I'll fucking kill you! Alec, they're fucking frogs! They're my friends! They don't care if I was sick once, they like me anyway! Here we go again. How long are you gonna milk this traumatic fever bullshit? The doctor said there'd always be effects. Yeah, you'll always be an asshole. Now let's go. Frank wants us back in camp now. I'm not going. Oh, yes you are. I said I'm not going. And I said you are. Now let's go. No! Oh, little asshole. I'm going to kick your ass. Get out of here. Cut the shit out. I'm not going back. Come on, Al. Give me the knife. Come on, Al. Give me the knife. Give me the fucking knife! You're fucking nuts, Al. And you know what? I don't give a shit what you do anymore. After this, we see Lenny is cooking hamburgers and reading. I'm guessing it's a porno, Maggie. Seems kind of sleazy. I can't really tell, but I would assume because that fits in with the way that Sleepaway Camp films go. Uh, he goes to check on the burgers. As he's flipping them, he pulls some fries from the fryer. After that, he makes some kind of a racist impression of Isaac Hayes, talking about more oil in the fries than there is in the fryer or something like that. Just basically bitching about his boss, but doing an impression of him that I found pretty fucking offensive, actually. As he begins to scrub the top of the Friar, we see someone walk in behind him from frame. The killer, Angela, grabs a hold of Lenny and sort of does this wheelbarrow thing where he has to grab a hold of the side of the Friar. He's threatening the killer, Angela, and telling Angela, the killer, he's had enough to leave him alone. He talks a bunch of shit very reminiscent of part one with the child rapist chef who gets boiled alive when they're on the chair and the chair's being shaken and kicked out from underneath him. Right as I thought that, the killer then pulls up a chair to get more leverage and hold Lenny high above the fryer to really dunk him in. After several threats, somehow Lenny burns his thumb and loses his grip and is tossed into the fryer. The effect and shot of the body in the fryer is okay. Uh, they hold way too long on it to sell it. It's clearly bubbly water with some like soap mixed in or something like that, and then air bubbles being blown to try and sell the fact that it's still bubbling oil. Like I said, they hold it too long. Plus, the guy holding onto the sides of a metal fryer, the sides of the fryer would have been so fucking hot, he would have been burning his goddamn hands anyway. Like, even when he was trying to clean it. I don't think that's how it works. None of the fryers I've ever worked as a kid ever fucking didn't burn the shit out of you if you touched them anywhere other than the handles <laughs> that are sticking out the side. And even those, you had to wrap, like, wrap towels around not to burn yourself. Anyway, that doesn't fucking matter. Uh, it's a nice callback. It's a solid attempt. It just didn't quite work for me. The post-fried look is pretty awesome, however. Whenever the killer pulls Lenny back out or he falls out, the post-fried look of his head is pretty fucking awesome when they're just kind of leaving it there when the body gets dropped. Then the killer gets really wise of what they're doing, puts the body into one of those big black garbage bags and then carries it out to the dumpster. This dumpster has a built-in compactor, so the killer then uses that to push the body all the way to the back and kind of hide it in with the other garbage. That's fucking smart. We then see the chef and Ronnie hanging out talking about Frank's new Avery that he's building. We see it kind of close or whatever. He said, is it a shrine? I don't know if that might have been a cabin where some murders had happened earlier or what it was supposed to be, but apparently they're building the Avery for the children. They then go to talk to Frank and that's our next clip. Charlie needs to speak to you, Frank. First, say hello to Matilda. She's very excited to see you, Ronnie. Hi, Matilda. Say hi, Matilda. Hi, <laughs> Matilda. Ah, isn't she so smart? <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I love you so much. I love you so much. <laughs> I think she's starting to look a little like you, Frank. Is that a bad thing? Charlie's having problems in the kitchen again, Frank. It's that damn fool Mickey. Boy, as useless as tits on a bull. Just this night, I told him to get the garbage out for it to track the rats into the kitchen. Garbage's still there, and he's long gone. So fire the guy. He's probably on drugs anyway. Then we'll have to offer more money. Otherwise, all we get is another Mickey. <laughs> Look, fellas, I'm not paying any more money for perfect attendance. That's clear? Huh? Now, are we done here? Because I got things to do. We still didn't do anything about the rats by the compact. Again with the rats? They're a health risk, Frank, and I say we do something about them. 
Don't forget, I own a piece of the place, too. Yeah, and don't you forget, it's a very small piece. That's not fair, Frank. I'm just playing with you, booby. Come on. Charlie, replace that guy in the kitchen. And we'll talk about the rats later, I promise. Fine. Oh, look at my baby. Say goodbye, Matilda. Now, if you uh, gentlemen will excuse me, I have to use the John. Too many beans in that casserole, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Tight ass motherfucker. Hey, I didn't know you and Frank were partners. Only a junior partner. And believe me, there's nothing more junior than being a junior partner of Frank's. <laughs> After this, we have a montage of kids just having fun at camp, like every kid fucking should be doing while at camp, you know, just hanging out with one another, playing games, that kind of thing. Some of them are just playing some games. Some are standing in line for a concession stand, that sort of stuff. We then see two stoner dudes that were making fun of the cop with the Vox box earlier, rolling dried cow dung into a joint to try to trick someone into smoking it. This is apparently something that they do every year and yet no other kids have caught on, or at least they pick out one kid a year and maybe they don't make a big deal out of it to make fun of the kid later, but you would think you would be told not to trust them if they offer you a joint that they don't automatically smoke too, but whatever. Then Alan shows up because, again, he's just showing up everywhere trying to basically fit in, but ended up being a spaz about everything that happened earlier. He shows back up and he swore he'd never come back, but he's here. Again, he can't really be alone for too awful long because I'm sure he just wants to fit in. He starts picking on some of his cabin mates because they're smaller than him and it makes him feel a little bit better and bullying's a fucking cycle, you know? They say that he should go bother the girl that he really likes who is across the way hanging out with some of the other stoner assholes that were making fun of the cop with the Vox box earlier. He waves. She gets a dreadful face while everybody makes fun of her for being liked by him. The asshole stoners that are there invite Alan over because he thinks that they're going to actually like him. He calls his other cabin mates losers right after that happens. They all have their candy hidden. Once he disappears, it all pops out, except for the one kid who lost his because he was already eating it. This causes a little bit of a start between the girls, Alan and the asshole stoner kid. It's like a little bit of a spat between the girls that are kind of bullying Alan and then Alan who's kind of being an asshole back but then again this asshole stoner kid's being a real ass everybody's just treating everybody like shit because I guess that's what kids fucking do. Alan tries to talk to Karen who is totally grossed out at how bad he smells once they all leave and then confesses that Mickey who is apparently the guy Lenny is playing had cornered her when she was doing cleanup and she was saved when Ronnie walked in so that whole really creepy guy in the kitchen thing is still going on. It's not the head chef it's this other guy who's like an assistant chef but they're doing a little call back there. Alan says he would have killed Mickey if he was there. Alan's very protective of her because again he thinks he cares about her. He's just confused and he's a troubled child. The girl from the first clip who was fighting with Alan grabs Alan by the wedding tackle squeezing him until he screams in pain saying did he really think she would forget what he did? Well as we heard he dumped food all over her and then just be letting him go. And then after she lets go the main kid TC gives Alan what is referred to as a purple nurple or an titty twister or whatever you want to call it. Alan is hurt, doesn't know how to react, but eventually figures out how to shove TC to the ground. Now, here's the thing about Alan. If he knew how to handle himself a little bit better, he'd be able to handle these bullies no problem. But that's not necessarily the type of growth that Alan needs just yet. He needs emotional growth. He's not prepared for the world around him. Frank ends up intervening and sends Alan back to his cabin because, of course, the owner is going to punish the troubled kid and not the kids that are being assholes. He accosts him in front of everybody for causing trouble. Even though a counselor came to his defense. That's Petey. Alan sneaks off behind the stage and ends up finding the stoner kids who trick him into smoking the cow shit joint. They laugh as he chokes trying to smoke the joint and practically throws up. It's really hard to fucking watch this. He kind of falls down to his knees and he's clutching at one of their legs trying to hold himself up because he's looking for help. He's a confused kid and kids do that sometimes where they just hug somebody's legs for comfort and that's what it looks like but he is dry heaving and coughing. It just looks like he's gonna fucking throw up but the convulsions from the right angle, it looks like he's giving head. So that's when TC and the other stoner buddies show up. They all make fun of Alan, who is clearly struggling to breathe and nearly dying. They decide they're going to call him Blowjob, which is a name that sticks for the rest of the film, and tell him he has been smoking shit and not weed. When the counselor who defended Alan earlier, Petey, shows up, she rushes him away and tries to console him. Ronnie shows up and lays down the law, but no one really listens but Alan, who takes off. The stoners are out smoking. There's just the main 
to the tricked Alan into smoking the shit joint. They're hanging out with two of the girls from the popular clique in the camp, and they're tired of these two dudes' shit, and the weed is pretty much not doing it. So there's a character named Weed. He throws a joint away, I guess because he didn't want to finish it, which is dumb for multiple reasons, because A, that's wasteful, but two, he throws it into a pile of gas cans that are all sitting outside, and he could have blown them all up, and one of the girls even points that out. His stupid stoner friend goes and grabs the joint and keeps working on it. Weed decides he's too stoned to move or too lazy or something, but he just decides he's going to stay there and sleep in this chair because it's like two in the morning and whatever. So as a buddy just abandons him to go hang out with the girls and maybe try and see if he can get laid. I don't know. Weed then passes out and our killer grabs a can of gas, some rope, and the can of gas has like this uh, pump in it. One of those like squeeze hand pump type things that will bring the gas out of the can and throw it through a tube. So you can gas up uh, something that may not take a gas nozzle by sticking the tube in there. Or if you do it right, you could also siphon gas from one thing into another. I think that might be what it's for, but I'm not sure what the can's going on. But anyway, it's set up. The tube gets shoved down the stoner's throat. The killer then starts pumping the gas from the can into the stomach of the kid, weed, but it's a bunch of it spilling out all over him and shooting out of his mouth. It's to sell the effect of the liquid coming out and that the tube's still down his throat, but he's overfilled. I guess. I don't know. But then the killer, fuck it, Angela, tapes over his nose and mouth so that he can't breathe except through one tiny hole with tape. And the tape reads the words, drugs are for dummies, written across the tape, which fits in with part two and part three, so we're kind of going back with that. Then Angela jams a joint into that small hole of an opening and lights it, but with that much gas the kid spit out all over himself... They both should have gone up right there, but anyway. He tries to stop the joint shaking his head, but somehow with him shaking his head, one of the cherries sets off the gas, or somehow with he's breathing in the combusted smoke, the maybe he breathes out through the joint too, and the gas fumes light like a match or something. I don't know exactly how that's supposed to work, but somehow him having this joint be the only way that he can breathe in and out, it causes him to explode into a giant ball of flame. It's CG. It looked kind of okay. They cut from that to a body bag of the stoner kid's body screaming Weed's name, and the bird burn up corpse looks pretty fucking cool. We then have Frankie and Ronnie start arguing and that's our next clip. I got a bad feeling about this Frank. Yeah, I feel good. We're gonna lose over half of the camp now. That's thousands of dollars. We found this near the body. Say, what did I tell you? Drugs. Goddamn drugs. I think there's more to it, Frank. Here we go again. What does that mean? Every time something happens around here, he thinks he's back in Camp Arawak. Arawak? Isn't that where that kid went on a killing spree? Yeah, that's the place. Ruined the camp business for, for years. Ronnie was the head counsel over there. What happened to that kid? What happened to the kid? Her name was Angela. Last I heard, she was locked up in a sanitarium outside Rochester. He was locked up. What was that? The girl Angela turned out she was a he, and the kid pretended he was the sister who died years before. You believe that? Sounds pretty bizarre. You sure he's still locked up? As far as I know, you could talk to her cousin Ricky. He's up in Anslin. Maybe I'll do that. We're about wrapped here, show. Thanks, Hal. You got it. Uh, sure, thanks for everything. But we got things to do. So you let me know if anything comes up, okay? Will do. Okay, thanks. Are you out of your goddamn mind? Sorry, Frank. I just didn't think. Don't think. Now you listen to me. I don't want to hear another word about this Angela crap. Understand? Yeah. Now clean up this mess. Look at these campers out here. We're lucky if we're not closed down by tomorrow. All right, I'll take care of it. Goddamn idiot. We then cut to a camper's montage of the various kids doing various activities. Alan's interfering with everybody and being annoying. Like, he goes into the croquet game and starts kicking around their balls and just getting in the way. Again, it's like a like an angry five or six-year-old kid who just doesn't understand, but he's got the body of like a 16 or 15 or 45-year-old man. He's big. He's built. This kid could do some damage, but he's developmentally challenged, as we said. Uh, Alan has a thing where he wants to bring Karen to like the secret hideout place. He just wants to get to know her and he's trying to reach out and make a friend or make a girlfriend or whatever. He just wants her to like him. She doesn't want to go, but she's definitely not going to go there with him alone and she just wants her to leave him alone. He says he will not leave her alone. He will not leave any of them alone no matter what and starts kicking the croquet balls around like well, he's being an immature jerk, but again, he's a developmentally challenged kid. The other girls immediately pressure Karen into leaving just to get him out of their way and to leave them alone. Karen finally agrees as long as someone else comes with her. Alan is totally happy 
happy with that because he likes the other girl that Karen picked to come along with her. He thinks she's nice as well. And he finally decides he's going to take off. And holy shit, was that Melanie from Glow as their counselor? Holy shit. Yes, it is. We cut from this to Alan being a spaz at paintball, trying to join up. We just know this will result in Alan being even more annoying and awful. But also, he's going to get picked on a hell of a lot more. So we're going to then feel really bad for him and just wish someone would give him a chance and like be a friend and tell the kid to take a fucking shower or something, you know. But he's getting picked on from afar when he runs out into the woods because he just wants to play. He just wants to have a good time with everybody. They are calling him a low job from various unseen areas and they're luring him around. And then he's surrounded by a ton of people with the paintball guns, which I'm guessing is supposed to be on the opposite side. They're all dressed in blue. He's wearing yellow. So he runs away. But as he's running away, he is shot at firing squad style where they kind of encircle him by the opposing team. And then he runs over to his own team and they start rounding around him and firing at him like in firing squad style, just wasting all the paintballs on him. He starts getting chased from both sides. They're coming around him in like a semicircle that forms into a circle, like this like hunting fashion of hurting him. He's being bombarded the entire time by paintballs. Even after he falls to the ground, they continue to just shoot him again and again until they pretty much run out of paintballs. When they finally stop, Alan is crying and runs off screaming that he hates them. Justifiably so, Jesus fucking Christ. This is fucking hard to watch. I mean, the kid is an asshole, but he does not deserve this. He's a troubled kid who just doesn't know how to get along with other people like at all. All right, they fade from this to a cement truck drives past in a construction site and we see the Angela cop car showing up to interrogate her own cousin. And holy shit, that is actually the dude who played Ricky as a kid all grown up. I just realized that. That's our next fucking clip. Hey, I'm working here. You must be Ricky. What's with the voice? The big C. Too many of those. Ain't life a bitch. So are you, Ricky? You know I am, so cut the shit. The head counselor over at Camp Hanabi said this accident that happened over there may be related to your cousin Angela. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, considering she's been locked in a rubber room for the last 20 years. You sure about that? Yeah, I'm sure I go to see her every few weeks. I'm the only one who goes to see her. You mean him? What? Him. Angela is really a man now, isn't she? You know what? Fuck you! I gotta get back to work. If anything else happens, I may be back. That a threat? No. I just might need your help. Knock yourself out, deputy dog. <laughs> One day I'll show them! And I'll always stay with my friends! Well, we're here. I can't believe it! What are you doing here? That seems to be the question of the day. Well, come on, come on, sit down! You guys want some soda? Um, yeah, sure. Why not? Ew! What's with all the frogs? Oh, they won't hurt you. They're my friends. You know, besides Michael, you and Maria are the only two people that have been here. Gee, what an honor. So, what do you do around here, Alan? It seems kind of lonely. <laughs> What? Where are you going? You are so sick! No! Oh no! At the end of the clip, we see what looks like a bunch of skinned frogs falling from the trees, and the girls think Alan did it. Alan is horrified, too, and can't cope with what is happening, screaming what happened, and it turns out it was his stepbrother, Michael, the entire time, and his buddy, who perpetuated this act of severe animal cruelty. Alan charges them and is tossed to the ground. Alan tries to explain to Karen what happened as he's, she's running away, he runs up to her, and he's screaming, like, trying to explain he would never do that, trying to talk about how the frogs were his friends. But she is obviously terrified by the wanton cruelty and runs even faster because obviously she thinks Alan did it. The fucking stepbrother set it up on that, that way on purpose. We then see the kids on the lake calling Alan blowjob again from afar, adding to his torment. These are the stoner kids and the friends like TC and them. The three boys jump off the inflatable raft and swim over to continue to torment Alan. He is desperate to explain what happened and no one is willing to listen. His counselor even accosts him once again and no one will listen to Alan no matter what he tries to say and he's obviously flustered he can't communicate. Everybody dislikes him anyway and they're automatically going to assume he did something wrong just because they're irritated by him. And the fucking kid just gets picked on, including the counselors. One of the fucking female counselors starts calling him BJ. She's a fucking counselor. <sighs> 
fuck. Anyway, Randy sets up Alan for a massive wedgie from the guys. He's a fucking counselor and he does this. Everyone laughs. His fucking underwear gets torn free. They hold it up aloft like it's a fucking trophy. The kid falls into the lake. The only counselor who has any fucking sympathy for Alan, which is Petey, jumps into the water to try and help him to shore as he's panicking. She keeps him calm. She gets him to shore. And this is another scene that harkens back to the original movie when Meg tosses Angela into the water. That also leads to our next clip. Easy, Calm down. Everything's all right. Oh, look, now there goes a handsome couple. <laughs> You're a fucking bitch, Lindy. You know that? Oh, that really hurts. Coming from a skank like you. I hate them. I hate all of them. Take it easy, Alan. You're going to make yourself sick. I'm a little late for that. <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> going on here? What happened to him? What do you think happened? When are you going to do something about this? <laughs> Come on, Karen. Don't be such a wuss. Yeah, you know we can't do this without you. I don't know. Hasn't he been through enough already? Come on. Just a little joke. And besides, he likes it when we make fun of him. That's right. He thinks we like him because we take the time to beat the shit out of him. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, TC. Oh, come on, Karen. It'll be right. Hey, shush up. Here he comes. Evening, b b b blowjob. <laughs> you better shut up, TC. I didn't say anything. Lay off, TC, okay? Come on, doll. You better hurry up. We're going to miss our <laughs> reservation. <sighs> oh, sweetheart. You really should have thought about that 15 minutes ago. Hmm? Come on, we're going to be late. Come on. We're going to be late. Why not? That's my little baby, huh? You be a good baby while daddy's out, okay? Okay, my sweet Matilda. Ah, stinks. What did you say? Ah, stinks. The son of a bitch. Frank, where are you going? Lemon boy, Mr. Moran. Out the door. I get ahead of you, Toby. I'm kind of in a hurry. No, Alan, wait your turn just like everyone else. After the clip, Alan heads into the line for the concession stand and is once again annoying and picking on the girl with the pigtails that he's been picking on and everybody else in the line. They're all smaller than him, so he's just picking on them. Again, it's really hard to have sympathy for the kid when he continues to bully everybody else that's smaller than him, but it appears to be, at this point, the only thing that he really understands. He probably just thinks that this is how people treat each other because this is how everybody fucking treats him. I guess. I hope that's what the filmmakers were going for because this is really hard to watch either way. The girl who has been fighting with Alan, we heard heard earlier in the clip that also crushed his fucking nuts, then starts spitting a spitball at him. She gets one as he's chewing, that's right, chewing on the pigtail of the girl in front of him just so he can get ahead of her. She calls him gross, and he very much is. She gets grossed out and then just leaves the line so he gets to move up and he thinks that's awesome. The spitball, when it hits him, actually hurts him and immediately blames the kid from behind because it hits him like in the back of the neck, which causes a bit of a ruckus. The kid says he didn't do it. No spitball from him. Alan is still getting hit by them, so then he starts looking around, which is causing further problems as he's yelling and about getting hit by the spitballs. And he can't tell who's doing it, so obviously he's scared and pissed and all of that. And then he actually sees her do the last one that hits him on the forehead, so he charges over at her. Alan is confronted by Frank, who accuses him of corrupting his bird and is abusive and screams a bunch of things at him. This causes Alan to freak out, run off screaming, Frank's ass stinks. Again, this is a motif for him. Like That's like his exit. He doesn't say anon. He goes, your ass stinks and runs off. That leads to our next clip. Frank's a real jerk, isn't he? Yeah, he really is. Listen, Alan, some of the girls and I were playing Spin the Bottle behind the stage, and um, we wanted to know if you would want to join us. You mean it? Yeah, sure. Wow, I don't believe Yeah, come on. Awesome. Here we are. How come all the lights are out? Um, you always play Spin the Bottle with the lights off. Oh. Come in. Shut the door, Alan. Hey, where's everybody else? Don't worry. They'll be here. Karen? Karen, you there? Right here, Alan. Just getting a flashlight. Okay. Hey, 
This is a setup of a prank to strip Alan down to his underwear. They bag his head so he can't see, and then they shove him out in front of everyone after they shut off all of the lights. But the one good goddamn counselor in this whole thing who tries to help him shows up, Petey, to try and get what's going on. And then Ronnie accosts everyone for what they did, because clearly this is too far. Ronnie's still a good guy. He just wants the kids to have a good time. We then see when Ronnie's accosting everyone, Karen gets extremely guilty for what she did, as she should. This was fucking wrong, Karen. That leads to our next clip. <laughs> On. Turn the lights on now! I want to know who did this. I want to know right now. What do you want from me? It's my night off. It's not. Now find out. Okay, okay, Jesus. I think he's finally asleep. You okay, Ronnie? You know, it's funny, Petey. Every time Alan gets in any trouble, you're always there. What's that supposed to mean? Who are you? Ronnie. Who are you really? Where do you come from, huh? Ronnie, you're scaring me. Every single time Alan gets in trouble, there you are, Johnny on the spot. Why is that, Petey? Huh? Why? What are you talking about? Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Peter? No, wait. It's not Peter, is it? No. It's Angela! Ronnie, stop it! I'll stop it! I'm gonna put a stop to it right now! Ronnie! We have to do something before it's too late! Before she kills someone else! Take it easy now, Ron. It's her, Sheriff. I know it is. I can feel it. She's here. Who's here? And what the hell is this? Angela, Frank. Angela, she's here. I told you, enough of that crap. There is no Angela. Yes, there is. It's her. Oh, yeah? Why don't you just go back to your cabin now? Honestly, Frank, I don't know what he's talking about. No! There's something going on out there. Now what? The kids better stop that noise and return to your bunks. I'm telling you for the last time, stop that noise immediately. Guys, stop it. Just lie down, go back to sleep. Okay. That's it. You're all confined to your bunks for the rest of the week. Stop calling me this! Stop calling me this! Take it easy, Alan. Tell him to stop. Tell him to stop. Get down, Alan. Shut the fuck up! I told you to watch your mouth. Get away from me! You little bastard. about where's he gonna go the boy is sick frank yeah he's sick all right and now i'm starting to wonder about you alan <laughs> you boys are all in trouble so did you find the little monster no no sign of him anywhere i'm worried frank you saw his condition before he ran off listen i've been in this business a long time and believe me i've seen much worse tantrums than that trust me he's around i just hope we find him soon I'm gonna make a sandwich. You want something? No, I'm gonna keep on looking for Alan. Well, you just keep me posted. Yeah. After this, we see a scene of Frank's bird in its cage as someone grabs it and drags it out of the cage, squeezing it rather hard. This makes the bird scream. Frank then comes out to see what's going on because he loves that fucking bird and is hit in the head with a fucking hammer. This dissolves into Frank is tied up in a chair. Angela brings the bird cage over toward his head and has the cage cut out so that it can lock over his head and around his neck perfectly, putting his entire head into the cage. Then it's locked into place with a couple of padlocks. Frank comes to, wants to know what's going on because of his head hurting really, really fucking bad, wakes up to see the bird cage, demands to be let out of the cage. Angela brings over a bag full of some type of animal. We can see that it's moving as she drags it over. It also appears that anytime Frank moves or struggles with his head, he will also be cutting into his neck because the cage has something set up in such a way to jonk, like to poke into his neck and cut him or slice him and there's blood already coming through once the cage is closed, so he's screwed no 
matter what, it's probably going to open up a vein or his throat or whatever. But then we see Angela dump two, maybe three rats into the cage with him after hitting the bag a shitload to anger them. And then we hear them chewing and screeching as they're eating or attacking him or something along those lines. Frank starts screaming. That dissolves to our next clip. This is bad. This is so bad. I don't understand why you're freaking out, Karen. Did you see the look on his face? He's crazy, Marie. You remember what he did with those frogs? Come on, Marie. Don't you see what you're doing? Shit. Stop bouncing around so much. Oh, chill out, Bella. You know, I was the one that lured him here. Oh, stop it. It was just a joke. That wasn't a joke. That was cruel. Yeah, whatever. Hey, you ladies want to go back down to the rec hall? All this excitement has got me jonesing for some ice cream. Like she needed an excuse. You dissing me for us? Come on, Karen. My treat. No, I don't think so. Well, I'm not going if you're not going. Me neither. What about you, Bella? Fuck that shit. Take a look at that ass, girls, because that's the last thing you're going to be looking at as I walk through that door. Oh, all right. Please, Miss Karen. Don't you want to go back down to the canteen with us? Pretty please. Sure, okay. All right, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> TC, what are you doing? Scoping tits and choking the weasel. Well, get your ass up, boy! Yeah, man, we're going on a panty raid at the younger girls' funk. <sighs> Forget it, guys. Ronnie grounded me for the rest of the summer. <sighs> yeah, like he'll even know. He said he's gonna check on me every 15 minutes. And how many times has he checked on you so far tonight? None. And how big a pussy are you for even thinking about what he said to you? All right. You convinced me. Pet a boy! TC, get your butt back in that cabin now. Well, busted big time. Give the boys my regards. Sorry, man. Later. Jesus Christ, Linda. I think you gave me whiplash. <laughs> that was fun. Was that four-wheel drive? No, you got to push the second stick down there. How about the third stick? That's kind of weird. What the hell is that? It's the pumps. They pumped the water from the lake to the camp. Oh, so that's why they call it the pump house. Oh, no. This is why they call it the pump house. Oh, real cute, Randy. Do you hear something? I told you it's the pump. No, it's not, moron. Listen. It's in the water. How can you hear anything over those freaking pumps? Come on, let's go. The pump house is missing. Stop doing that. Oh, Randy, you take me to the nicest places. Only the best for you, darling. Yeah. I just want to say, first of all, I think I saw a boom mic in the shot during this clip when the girls are arguing at the beginning of it. I'm not 100% sure they're in their cabin. I think I saw it like just a little bit from above. All right. So at the end here, as the couple wander off to go have sex, we see Angela's hat moving into the frame for the sheriff character and the couple start making out in the woods. Then the girl hears something. The guy decides he's going to be a jerk and say it's some kind of cropsy maniac. I'm guessing that that's a nod to the burning and the legend of cropsy that influenced it. Maybe that was an influence on Sleepaway Camp as well. Maybe it was a wink and a nod. Cropsy legend was also an influence on the Mad Men movie, which had to change its name to Mad Men because of the burning. There you go. She then goes over to him when he calls her. They start making out again, and she stops to ask if he has a sleeping bag. He says it's in the Jeep. She wants to make him get it, but he says he has to piss, so he makes her go to get it. Just so he can piss, using the phrase, make a little winky. Yeah, that's a phrase he used. She says the mood is killed after he says he wants her to go to to get the bag a little quicker so she doesn't see him being. I don't get it, but whatever. She wanders off to get the sleeping bag. Dude starts pissing and Angela ties him up midstream to the tree. She like ropes around the arms and everything, pulls him back super tight so he can't move, holding him in place by the tree, then ties up around his neck as well, pulls it even tighter. I think loops a couple more times around his arm. But when he falls back, his pants aren't being held up. They fall down around his ankles. We kind of see that when he's being tied up. Then a wire snare is slowly lowered in a very suggestive way towards his crotch. And he thinks it's a sex game at first until his manhood is fully ensnared in the wire and then it gets pulled tight. He begins yelling that it's too tight and that the wire needs to stop and to drop loose. He still thinks it's the girl that he's with to have a good time and that this is just some kind of kinky game she's into. But then he says that's enough and stops. So then the wire drops. He says that he's starting to lose his mood and then the wire slowly starts to be uncoiled and pulled forward again. He's still 
hopes it's a joke, but he's starting to panic, screaming Linda's name because he doesn't know what's going on. The wire starts to cinch up more on his crotch, and it appears to be something in the pump house that's pulling it forward, maybe? I'm not 100% sure. He then calls out Linda's name again and again, which is his lady, as she calls out for him until he really panics and asks if it's Alan and begs him to let him go, and that he is sorry, but then he threatens to kill him as he panics even more. This then panics Linda, who drives off, ripping off the dude's wedding tackle in the process. This is a simple thing to say, what happens, and to write down in your notes. But the Jeep gets stuck, because apparently Linda is not familiar with driving stick, or at least this Jeep might be too temperamental for her. Maybe she's just not familiar with the Jeep. But she gets it stuck. So there's a lot of backing up and lurching forward, and backing up and lurching forward when she's stuck in like this mud hole with the back tire, because it's only in two-wheel drive. They pointed that out earlier. And this sequence will make you fucking squirm, particularly if you possess wedding tackle. Just imagine a wire around your genitals slowly cutting it off with tension being pulled from a car. I'm sure you can imagine how painful that is, right? It takes a really long time. It does a really good job of building the tension, not just on the wire either. All right, so as Linda drives off, she notices barbed wire around the tree, but it's too late to stop as it is pulled free from the tree and wrapped around her face and her neck, and she then crashes into the tree. It's hard to tell what really happens to her at this point. We find out later on, but it looks as though she may be dead. But if she's not dead, she may not be long for this world because she took barbed wire to the neck and it wrapped around the rest of her head. And then she crashed the car. We cut to TC returning from the toilet as something like a wood spike sticks up in a hole in the floor below his bunk and ruptures his porno mag and it almost gets him. He jumps back shouting what the fuck when a friend jumps in and screams about how much fun they just had in the panty raid. He is talked into looking into the hole, the panty raid friend that is, and they then take turns looking into the hole, arguing about how sharp the stick is, which is clearly a sharpened broom, they say, until TC finally gets spiked. He flails around screaming, but I don't think he's injured to the point of death until he headbutts the fucking wall, driving the carved up broom handle through the back of his own goddamn skull. The panty raid dude wails like a fucking banshee and runs out. They cut from this to Ronnie comes back with another counselor to Frank's house and finds the bird screeching, your ass stinks at them. This makes them automatically think that Alan did this. They then walk in to find Frank has died old school medieval style as they went down his throat and out of his stomach. That's the rats that is. I guess they were fed to him directly to his head. I don't know if the bag was tied over his head to keep the rats in there or if the cage was small enough to keep the rats from getting out any other way, but they somehow ate their way through him and out the bottom of the cage. That was kind of a cool idea. Right after that, Frank says it's starting again and they cut to the girl who's been warring with Alan the entire time, who grabbed his junk and was spitting spitballs at him and Alan dumped food on her. She returns to find her bunk is disordered. She has a paperclips moment over it, screaming about how everything is all fucked up and all these bitches always are touching her stuff. She's very angry about it. The bed sheet that's annoying her from before falls down over again. She rolls over to sort of pull at it and move it or something like that. And then she sees there is a shitload of nails in a board that is just above her. Then we see Angela jumps from the top top ridge beam of this cabin onto the bunk, driving all of those nails into her skin and crushing the girl as well. Blood pours out and there is a really satisfying, pretty spectacular crunch noise as Angela hits. Like it's real sudden crunch blood. Pretty cool. They cut from this to Ronnie declaring that Angela is back and a kid interrupts Alan's stepbrother's lame attempt to get laid by Karen saying that TC has been killed by a spear. Dude tries to call bullshit on this, but Karen is super freaked and runs off anyway because, well, what she did to Alan, she feels that she's next. Karen tells her bunkmate someone killed TC. Her bunkmate calls bullshit on this. This causes the other girl with them to run off. They find the crushed and nail perforated corpse of their bunkmate that we saw the death of earlier. So now they know it's real and Claren declares that Alan did it and that he is after her next. She is justifiably freaked out and runs for the fucking hills. They cut to our next clip. Nobody's leaving here till I find out where she is. I'm talking crazy, Ronnie. I know, Petey, you're way off base. Oh, yeah? Maybe you're in on this, too. Ronnie! Please, please don't tell her. What? Tell her she's dead. What's happening here? I keep telling you, Angela's here. She's killing again. There's no Angela, Ronnie. It was her brother, Peter, and he's in custody upstate. The killer's is Angela. Talking about. It's Alan. Karen said Alan killed Bella. You've got to get her next. And he's already 
killed Frank and TC. Hey, what's all the fun? Alan killed Frank and TC, Bella. What? Stop saying that. Kara thinks she's next if she ran away. We have to go find her. Nobody's going anywhere. Oh, shit. I'm going to stop this cycle right now. Hey, you see what you guys are doing now? Everybody get to your cabin, please. Come on, Marie. Well, here I am. Is that Ricky? Ronnie? What the hell are you doing here? I was going to ask you the same thing. Barney Fife told me to come here. I haven't spoken to you since we met last week. What are you talking about? You just called me an hour ago. Looks like somebody wants you here. The only one who wanted me is Angela. Now stop that. Then why is he here? We're wasting time. There's a killer up there with Karen and Michael. Whoa, what the fuck is she talking about? It's happened again, Ricky. Angela's back and she's killed three people already. What? We have to find those kids. She's right. I'll take the upper campus. You guys take the lower. Ronnie. All right, let me get some flashlights. Better keep an eye on Ricky. Well, don't worry, I will. After this, Karen runs through the woods and finds the tied-up counselor. With the missing junk, instead of helping him or checking up on him, she turns around and runs off, justifiably so. She should be terrified. It just keeps getting worse out there everywhere she looks. We then see her run for a little bit as she calls out for help. She runs over to the Jeep, where she seems to have found her camp counselor, what I believe is corpse. She's not moving at this moment. This means Karen may be our final girl. Her counselor appears to be dead from the damage done by the barbed wire, or at least incapable of helping in any way, shape, or form, no matter how much Karen decides to beg. The counselor is able to raise her head, so she's clearly alive, but she is in serious need of help herself. Looks like her jaw's all fucked up, like the barbed wire wrapped around, and then I think when she hit the tree, she, her face hit the steering wheel, driving the barbed wire deeper and breaking some of her face up, and I don't know, maybe the blunt force trauma and all the other stuff should have been enough to stop her heart, I don't know, but Jesus Christ, that's horrifying. Once again, Karen runs off off, terrified, justifiably so. Ronnie then catches up with Michael, and that's our next clip. Michael, it's fun, Karen, yet? Michael, it's too dangerous for you to be out here. Did you find her? No, not yet. What about Alan? Nothing. Fuck! Michael! Who's the nut? It's Alan's brother. He a suspect, too, or am I the only one? Hey, nobody Bullshit. said Bullshit! I'm just sticking around to prove all you assholes wrong. What follows after the clip is a scene of Karen running away in fear as she runs directly into Angela and passes out. But cut to other shots of people walking around. They're off looking for Karen. Then we see Karen comes to with her head in a noose set onto what looks like the basketball hoop in the gymnasium. All of the stage lights come on pointing directly at Karen. Let it never be said that Angela doesn't know how to make a production. Angela climbs down and and walks over to look at Karen. It appears that the plan is to use the basketball hoop raising it to hang Karen slowly as Angela turns the key in the basketball hoop then raises. It's one of those automatic ones. You see them in gymnasiums and schools all the time or multi-purpose things when they're not using the basketball hoop. A chain pulls it up to the ceiling with like a wench that's similar to like a garage door opener or what have you. Well, that's what's happening here, only instead of just pulling up the basketball hoop, it's slowly raising a rope that's still loose enough around Karen's neck. Karen has has more than enough time if she were to remain calm to stand up and pull the noose off of her neck. Now her character justifiably so panics, but we still watch as she slowly is dragged up into the air by this basketball hoop, screaming for help the entire time. I think her hands should have been tied for this, just to sell it a little bit better, but you know, it is what it is. And her legs too. She should have been hogtied and then this should have happened. It would have been more obvious that she's helpless and she needed help, but it's still, they tried to build tension. This part just didn't work with me. She still had plenty of time to pull the noose off the entire time. So Alan's brother stayed brother Michael comes in and Angela stops the basketball hoop and everything to distract Michael and then she darts off before returning as the cop pretending to help. Karen keeps screaming it was Alan as Angela lowers her slowly to the ground and Alan's brother darts off to kill Alan because he's had enough and he is fucking pissed. This leads to our next clip. Michael, don't stop picking on me, please! You're very bad, Alan. You've always been very bad. Oh, Michael! I will not let you hurt Karen. What about Karen? I know who you did to TC and Ben. What are you talking about? You're a mean sick. You're a monster, Alan. I'm not sick. Oh, yes, you are! <laughs> Stop it, Michael. I'm stopping you, Alan. Stopping you right now! Oh, 
<laughs> I'm going to spare you the rest of that in the clip because Michael beats on Alan while he is begging for help. He's hitting him in the back and the head with a croquet mallet. There's a couple of shots where it looked like he probably could have broken his back and crippled him, maybe broken some ribs and made it to where he could barely breathe. He's doing serious damage and it's really hard to watch and it's pretty fucking brutal. It then appears that Angela stops him from being able to kill his stepbrother, Alan, by grabbing the croquet mallet and then it fades to black. We see Ricky and Ronnie and the other counselor all out looking for Alan and Michael and some of the other kids are shouting various names. I didn't catch them all, but they're like looking for some of the missing kids. They're just doing a search group. We kind of seen this before in Sleepaway Camp 1. We see Ricky and Ronnie and the other counselor all out looking for Alan and Michael and some of the other kids. They're shouting various names. I didn't catch them all, but they come upon Alan laying there. At the time, we think he might be dead, but he's probably unconscious because the beating was pretty bad, but it's hard to tell. Uh, there's this really neat effect where it's like this bloody hair mat where like he got hit in the head with what looks like the croquet mallet and there's a blood clot there that's all clumped up with hair and the hair's all matted up in the blood. Looked pretty realistic. I've seen some head wounds like that before. Uh, my lawyer advises me not to tell you how, but it looked pretty realistic. It's a pretty decent effect. Ronnie runs over to Alan and tries to wake him up. We see that Alan is able to barely move, but he can move just enough to sort of point behind him. I think he may have had some kind of spinal injury that has possibly crippled him on top of everything else that he suffered. He's definitely injured too bad to be able to move. I'm not really sure exactly how bad it is, but he's clearly really messed up. He can barely talk and he can only move his arms slightly just to kind of point in the direction of what happened to Michael. He says Michael's name and Ronnie asks him what's up and what's going on with Michael. The female counselor then goes over to look and we hear the Angela robot voice and our final clip. They never learn, do they? They have to be so mean all the time. They think they can do whatever they want to you and get away with it. But they didn't know I was here, did they? I've been waiting a long time for this. A long time. In the end, they all get what they deserve. I knew it was you. Michael thought skinning frogs was cool. Ask him how cool it is now. Angela! All right, you can hear it right there. The counselor that went to check on Michael runs off screaming after what she sees that has happened to him. We then have Ronnie and Ricky come up after Ricky screams Angela's name to check on Michael. It turns out that Angela skinned Michael. It's a pretty cool fucking effect. It's very gory, and I'm pretty fucking impressed. Surprisingly, Michael is still alive, even though he's been skinned. Although, how long he will remain alive after being skinned this horribly? Like, there's meat removed, the rib cage is exposed. It's pretty horrific. Ronnie screams out no, and Angela laughs a very maniacal laugh. They cut back to the effect of the skinned Michael. Now, I don't know if this is just my eyes playing tricks on me or not, but I thought that you can actually see some of the organs underneath the rib cage moving under that exposed rib cage where the muscles all cut away as he's gasping for breath. I don't know who did this effect, but again, I'm really impressed. It's pretty fucking good. It looks great. And even when he's moving around gasping for breath, it must have tricked my eye or maybe I just saw what I wanted to see. I don't know, but if it was really there, that's fucking impressive. We hear more of Angela's maniacal laughter as it gets doubled, then tripled and moves around in like a stereo echo plex back and forth until suddenly she just stops laughing, closes her mouth, looks directly into the camera, staring right at us, the viewer, directly. We cut to black, roll those motherfucking reddits. Wow. Okay. I was not expecting this at all. I was expecting to dislike Return to Sleepaway Camp, maybe like a few things about it. I wasn't expecting a film to affect me in such a way to where I hated and sympathized with nearly every character simultaneously. I know this is going to sound bold and maybe it's just, you know, sentimental me around the holidays and all of that horse shit, but Jesus fucking Christ, uh, I found myself really conflicted with these characters and they actually had a lot of depth and I thought they were pretty well fucking written. Um, some of the acting may be a little bit ropey here and there because, you know, you're dealing with fucking kids, but this reminds me of everything I liked about the original Sleepaway Camp. The original creator, I do believe, came back to make this happen. Yes, that is correct. He was the original writer and director of both Sleepaway Camp and Return to Sleepaway Camp, so that makes sense as to why this has the same feeling. He wanted to go in the darker direction, as we discussed on the actual full franchise fest before this cleanup, and so when he got a chance to make another one, he made Return to Sleepaway Camp, and I gotta say, I'm thoroughly impressed with 
this. It feels pretty much the same way it feels to watch the original movie. However, there's a lot more complex characters. I feel like he's grown as a storyteller. This was very impressive to me, and I kind of wish I wouldn't have slept on this when the DVD was out, but maybe we can hope for another release someday. Well, I guess we'll see. Not going to tell you how I was able to get a copy of this film. Let's just leave it at that. I got my hands on it. Now I kind of wish I wouldn't sleep on it and I don't have to pay an overpriced, ridiculous price for a DVD because I'm not going to do that. But hey, if you can get your hands on this film, if you can find a way to see it, you will probably enjoy it as well. I am super shocked at how much I like this. I'm really shocked at how bummed out and angry I was at Alan and everybody else because they couldn't realize what was going on. Just wish someone would try to sit him down and talk to him. You know, <laughs> I guess it makes me a softy. Maybe it just means that I know what it feels like to be a kid like Alan and not fit in everywhere and just lash out at everybody because you feel like everybody hates you and you're just going to get at them first. I don't know if I ever went to this extreme. I certainly hope I wasn't as awkward and shy and weird and accosting and angry as what Alan is, but maybe I am. Maybe that's why the film affected me so much. But I have a hard time feeling bad for the kids that Angela killed for the most part because all of them were fucking rotten. The only one I feel like had any kind of redeeming hope was Karen, but she still did dissipate in the torment. And I feel like, wow, what happened to Michael was excessive. If you ask the frogs what they'd like to have done to him that him and his body skinned, I'm pretty sure they would be okay with what happened to Michael. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, this was a surprisingly good film. I really enjoyed it. And I hope my review gives you an idea of what you will get when you get a chance to finally see it. I tried to leave a few things here and there left up to you to be able to see whenever you actually get a chance to see the film. I hope you can find it, but Jesus Christ, don't pay the inflated, ridiculous, gouging price for the out-of-print DVD. Let's hope for an actual release someday. And with that, I'm going to play the Ending Legion promo. I'm going to have a little bit of music that got snagged out of one of the Sleepaway Camp films here. And when I come back, I'm going to close out this solo show and end your suffering. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Go Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. Sorry that you guys had to suffer with me all alone. I know there's a handful of listeners out here that are supportive and they like me enough to pretend like they like the shows when it's just me, but I know you guys all listen for Matt anyway, so... <laughs> Uh, you can find all the previous episodes of the show that contain Matt on our main landing and launching page. There's at least 277 of them, I think, that have them. Maybe less. I can't really remember. That's legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. We also have our Facebook group.
group where you can give Matt some well wishes and also just give us some thoughts on the solo show here and how bad I sucked. That is Cinema PsyOps on Facebook. We also have myself available to you on Facebook as Court PsyOps. Matt is also there as Matt PsyOp. He doesn't check his DMs very much, but if you want to check in on him and just let him know you're thinking about him, folks, you can reach him there as Matt PsyOp. Another way to reach out to him, you can email feedback to Matt, PsyopMatt at gmail.com. Give him your well wishes there. Let him know that you are thinking about him. You can also email feedback to me, CinemaPsyOpsCourt at gmail.com. Tell me to stop doing solo shows. You'd rather I skip a week. You can tweet a couple of tweets to a couple of twats on the hate-filled shitfest that is known as Twitter. I'm available there as Court underscore PsyOp. Just look like the guy buried under porn bots. Matt is also there as Matt PsyOp, although I don't know how active he might actually be. I'm also available on Instagram, Cinema underscore PsyOps. Don't you dare fucking mention the words OnlyFans or you'll get banned. That's what they're doing on Instagram. Repressed much? Zuckerfuck? Banning the nipple constantly. Well, folks, I would just like to just clearly state right now, I fully support the free and clear nipple. All ladies should go topless all the time if that is their want, and I am perfectly happy to allow them to do it. So free the nipple, kick the fuck out of this week, and make it your bitch. It's so cold at night, I'm begging you to stay. right this is a fucking clip show movie as i already fucking said i should have just done a clip show myself this week i mean for fuck's sakes it probably would have been a lot nicer maybe i don't know the listens are gonna suck on this nobody wants to hear me we're only like 12 minutes into this at this point and i fucking hate it like i don't want to talk about it anymore and i'm really pissed about taking the notes so i get a little nasty here in the large put of in the large pot of bottle in the large pot of boiling water for the corn in the part two, once again, that whole campfire thing we're talking about. Once Angela interrupts, they actually cut. We then get because she's stalking and then fucking I don't remember. That's all part one. Fuck this clip show. Whatever. It's a fucking clip show. Who cares? I can't remember exactly what the fuck they were trying to do with the whole what's your name or whatever it is that was going on there. I should probably just take that out. Fuck this note. He's pointing it at her. She is pointing it at her. His. I guess I don't I don't fucking know. When the counselor who defended him, Petey, shows up. When the counselor who defended Alien, they then walk into Frank. They then walk. solo show. Fuck.